Okay, thank you for coming this evening. We have a, a robust agenda tonight. Before we begin the regular board meeting, we have um, a public hearing on our school renovation funds or SRRF funds. Um, so earlier this year, we um, set, set out aside some um, funds we applied for to help upgrades um, to upgrade some of our facilities. So with Don Bresnahan here, he came, he's been in a few times to talk about what the funds mean, what they will do. Um, but as part of the process, we um, are having a public hearing this evening to talk through some of that as well and answer any questions that come up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan. So good evening, all. We're gonna, as Audra had mentioned, we're gonna go through um, a history of the revolving renovation fund, how we got here. Uh, we're going to talk about the awarded schools. I'm uh, very pleased to report that um, out of 109 applications, four schools from MSAD 60 made it. Uh, and, and actually, we scored the second highest in the state in terms of uh, funds. A lot of that has to do with what I do, which is uh, grant writing and making sure that I can, for the benefit of the taxpayer, for the benefit of the school board and the administration, reduce the cost of upgrading facilities. Uh, Steve Ferguson, who's here with me. And I'll just go back a couple here. Uh, so I, I run a division called the BIMS. Uh, Bill, Bill over here is uh, one of the people that actually uh, implements our projects. Uh, he's here as well, but uh, Kevin Moore is, uh, I'm, I, he needs no introduction. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we're here really as a benefit to him. It's amazing, folks. When I look around the state and I look at the condition of school facilities in the state of Maine, and I see the age, and a lot of times we're left with uh, two possibilities. One is to spend major, major dollars to renovate uh, school facilities, which uh, this district has considered in the past very expensive 50 70 100 million dollars is not unusual and that's all on the taxpayers uh nickel and in that case more than nickels the other alternative which is something that we're promoting is to ask the state to participate in funding some of these improvements that are badly needed and when uh Steve Ferguson is here, and Steve is actually the president of ARIS, which is an engineering firm that evaluates the school facilities. So what you're going to see quite a bit when, when Steve talks about the, the engineering aspect, and it's, it's hard. It's hard to make the infrastructure of schools seem interesting. Uh, because, you know, when, when we walk into a building, we just expect the heat to be on. We expect the lights to be on. We expect to be comfortable. But there's a lot behind that. And what's behind that is, in this case, in these four schools that were awarded the grant, uh, is equipment that is 35, 40, 45 years old. And not only is it beyond its life, um, it can fail at any time. And failure means closure of something and you don't want to do that so our approach is we want to go out and get as much funding for you as possible and we applied for all the schools and i know that that's a, probably a question that the board might have and others and the the fact of the matter is the other schools scored a point less than this group and the reason for that, as I explained to the admin team, is it would be incredibly unfair for the main Department of Education to have given all the money. And the pool of money this year was $25 million plus a $3 million rollover from a previous year where schools didn't implement the projects for whatever reason. It would have been incredibly unfair for them to award even more than the $6.1 million that they did to this school district. So uh, having said that, uh, we'll go through the schools, 
the financials of what the grant means and how it lays out, and then uh, the vote itself. And some of you wonder, like, what is your process? How do you how do you get here? And we actually retain subject matter experts. What is that? People that are very skilled in what they do. Steve happens to be one of them. So he works in school districts throughout the state, hospitals, universities. He understands how systems work. So he and Kevin have very different conversations than you and I would have. Uh, all about systems and not working. The good news is that he's here on the back end. And before you came in tonight, we were talking about the first phase of our projects and how places like the band room that were previously uncomfortable or the boilers that used to run all the time, we've fixed some of those problems. And Steve is a person that has actually measured some of the before and the after. So we look at everything and in looking at equipment, how does it affect educational services? So if there's no heat in the building or if there's low ventilation, and kids can get sleepy. So there is a real connection between age and performance of equipment and actual how you teach and how you learn. Is what you have reliable? Is it redundant? Meaning if one fails, is there a backup? And is it efficient? We're all interested in reducing the amount of money that we spend on energy because energy is incredibly expensive. So. How can we, or is it possible, when we put in new equipment, does it reduce our energy expenses? The other thing is, and I think that this is the pictorial that sort of tells it all here, is there is a lifespan of all the equipment. This building is almost 25 years old. Almost 25 years old. So. All of the information that is out there tells us that most of the equipment, whether it's boilers, piping distribution equipment, ventilation, has a lifespan between 15 and 25 years. And then you're at the end and you should be replacing that equipment. It's fully depreciated. So to understand where you are with reliability of heating in terms of distributing it. We've replaced the boilers here. Uh, is it code compliant? All these other issues. You're way out here. You're way past the useful life of all this equipment. Is that unusual for school districts in the state of Maine? The answer truly is no. But Again, we're about the reporting to you what we see here and trying to do something about it. And to the benefit of the taxpayer, to the benefit of the taxpayer, use state money so you don't have to have everything come out of your pocket to replace these aged systems. So we actually started this process. Kevin was asking about this a little bit earlier. He, he seems like he's a couple of my kids have gone through college if we've been here so long, but that's not the case. Um, we actually started in January of 2023, gathering all this information, filling out the applications, making sure that the application matches what the need is. So for 2023, the applications were due at the end of October, and they specifically said, we are only going to give money for priority one projects. Priority one projects are indoor air quality projects or projects that have ADA, uh, but we're not going to replace boilers and give you money for that. We're not going to replace roofs and give you money for that. It's only indoor air quality, which, by the way, the four schools have a lot of HVAC, indoor air quality, mechanical equipment, and building controls equipment. So you are the perfect candidate. Um, and then great news in February 2024 that we have the award, and then we've gone through the legal review, and we're hoping that on June 11th, your vote date, that um, there'll be an acceptance of the not only the three and a half million dollar grant award folks. There's also, this is the one thing that 
there is in the six point one million dollars. There's the remaining portion of that is actually financed by the main bond bank for ten years at zero percent interest. So for those of us that have financed used cars and other things, houses or whatever, zero percent is uh, incredible. And and the combination of the two is a, a gift. It truly is a gift. So I want you to know where you finished up here. Again, I, I told you that there were 109 applications. And I heard from uh, a number of Audra and Sue and Denise's counterparts that filled out those applications looking for this money to fix up their schools and they didn't make the grade and they were quite upset and they called into the main department of education and said why didn't we get the money and why did MSA 60 get the money and well, I have to give our grant writing team a pat on the back because uh, when we collect all the grants from the last three years, two years ago, we got 25% of the fund, total, total funds. Last year, we got 68% uh, of the total funds, including MSAD 60. Those other school districts, um, it was clear for our grant writing group why they didn't get the award. And that they submitted. So a little pat on the back to this whole admin team. We followed the rules, we did the right thing. And lo and behold, 6.1 million. 20, almost 22% of the available funds have been awarded to this district. Almost 22%. Now, this is the part where Kevin says, Don, you're not going to talk about the technical stuff tonight, right? And I said, no, Kevin, that is why Mr. Ferguson is here. So <laughs> over to my colleague and friend, Mr. Steve Ferguson. Wow, this is work. Yeah, or back. Okay, I got it. Okay. I got it. Hey, everybody. <clears throat> Thanks for having us in. Um, as Don said, I'm going to just talk about the four schools that we've got included in the list. Um, and I think I try and take the best pictures I can. I know they're not glamorous or anything, but um, I'll try and tell a story with it. I think as Don says, that the issue is simple. Um, most equipment is 20 to 25 years, according to my professional society, ASHRAE, um, and it varies to some degree. But the equipment that we have included in here <clears throat> is all like upper 30s, low 40s, 38 years old, 44 years old. And it is a testament a bit to the folks that are it. It's gotten that many years out of it. It's yeah. awesome. It's actually really good. Um, but the issue is that that equipment is going to fail. Um, there's already things about it that are showing it's tiredness um, and it's not working as well as it should for the students. And I think that's the message that come out of this with. So I'll try and show it and glad to answer any questions as we go along. But um, we'll talk first about Hanson. Um, Hanson actually is a building that has three different kind of phases to it. Um, or three different constructions. Uh, the first construction was built in 1979, and it still has three of the most lovely, old, and tired rooftop units that you've ever seen. And that's a picture of the inner workings of one of them, and you can kind of see it over the uh, over the table, but um, that's what that looks like. There's three of those green things sitting up on the roof, and they are tired. They have done all that they're going to do. Um, you can kind of see the doors kind of bent. Um, the inside is lined with fiberglass, um, and so you actually could get um, fiberglass particles in the airstream headed into the service areas. So these guys are are ready to be changed out, and we've um, included that in the uh, the work. Um, one of the other things um, that are, is part of the project is exhaust fans and some of the terminal equipment that is also beyond its life. Again, it's 44 years old. Um, and this is all part of the ventilation process in the school. And it's it's time for it to see some new light. It's, it's just old and tired. Um, one of the other things to talk about, though, um, it's not just equipment age, but controls. Um, the equipment is sitting there and it's doing its thing, but it's the controls that really 
make it work. And um, the control components at Hanson um, are just a little bit newer than that 44 year old rooftop unit. The problem is, is that the equipment is, the, the control components aren't made anymore. You can't buy those components anymore. And they're not talking properly to each other right now. Um, there are new ventilation strategies. There's new energy saving strategies. They can be implemented if you have the right controls. You don't have the right controls. And so um, that's also part of the project is to replace the controls at Hanson to give it a new life so that you can incorporate those energy saving strategies. Oops, Let's see if I can go back. So, um, oh, we're at Knowlton. Yeah, how quickly did we move across? So this is Knowlton, and um, uh, Knowlton is 38 years old. It's been around a while as well. And uh, the air handling units at Knowlton, you can see some nice photos I've got there. Um, they are also tired. And uh, one of the things that's concerning about Knowlton is um, the air handling systems are lined with this, this acoustical lining um, is fiberglass. And the coating that they put on that 38 years ago wears away. And we see this all the time. It's not special to MSA D60. It happens everywhere. Um, but after after 24 years, 25 years, and you're at 38, that 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 coating wears off. So again, you have that fiberglass particles that are open to the airstream and does get carried down into the occupied spaces. You can see the air handler in the bottom picture. Um, that's a pretty good picture of it really torn up. Um, so again, these units are 38 years old and um, they're really beyond repair. There's no way to really repair these units. And so we have um, we have those in the project as a replacement. Again, typical life is 20 to 25 years. We put 25, there, but it's really 20 to 25. So. Okay, again, we've got the terminal equipment in there, exhaust fans that are all part of that ventilation strategy. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, one of the other things with, about Knowlton uh, is that there's um, there's no way for all the, you know, you know a dishwasher, uh, you know, they pull it down and then they lift it up and all this steam kind of goes everywhere. I don't know if you've ever seen like a commercial kitchen uh, dishwasher. You got one in Knowlton, and there's no way for that vapor to leave the filter. It just sort of like collects in the room. There's a little exhaust grill up above, uh, and it really doesn't work effectively. So that vapor uh, goes into the building, and, and you can kind of imagine what that vapor does. Um, the moisture gets up in the ceiling, um, into these ceiling tiles. It collects, it moistens the ceiling tiles, and in warm weather, you can you can imagine kind of the mold that might start with that. So. Um, this is not acceptable. Um, so what we've included in this is just the installation of a hood and a new exhaust fan to take the vapor and the heat out of the building. So. Okay. Um, also with Knowlton, we've got the controls in this. Um, so, yeah. So um, in, in Knowlton, uh, they have pneumatic controls. And when I went in the Air Force in 1989, um, pneumatic controls were all the rage. But the way they work is you take an air compressor, kind of like the same one that you have in your garage, and we send 20 pounds per square inch air throughout the entire building through these little tubes and these little pipes. And the way these things work is really springs and levers. We apply the 20 pounds per square inch on this side of the lever, and we push down on it. And depending on where you set the spring and the and the fulcrum um, dictates what that control thing does to change the signal over here to something less than 20 psi. They were great in the 70s and 80s. They were cutting edge in the 70s and 80s, but they're not cutting edge now. And the problem with that is that you can't apply these energy strategies and these ventilation strategies anymore. You just can't do it with pneumatics. Um, and so you have a lot of pneumatics in Knowlton. You also have more controllers that actually aren't produced anymore. So you've got this control system that isn't capable of um, doing modern ventilation and modern energy um, efficiency. The other thing I would say, Steve, yeah. is uh, just as an adder to that, mm -hmm. is is that um, you know you you hear everywhere you drive, you see people saying how fun 
help wanted. And part of uh, what we do is go to the trade schools and try to get folks uh, that are coming out of school, get them interested in uh, our trade, which is a little bit more difficult. It's not quite as uh, sexy as Google or Apple or SpaceX or something else, but they don't teach pneumatics anymore. And that's the challenge is that um, as you can see how um, Steve knows he's a little nerdy about this and how excited he gets on pneumatics and air, which was in 1989, it was the rage, but this is 2024, and we don't get anybody coming out of the trade schools that uh, even understand the principles of pneumatics. So it's impossible for us to find technicians to work on the equipment, and it's impossible for us to find replacement parts, even on Craigslist or eBay. And then, and sometimes it actually, folks, it does get that desperate. So you have to understand. That is sort of the, the generation of, of why it is really critical to change out these components because when they go to absolute failure, which they can, then that can close its hole and Kevin can call and be as, as nice and diplomatic as he wants. Um, but there's not a lot of things that we can do in that case. Sorry, Steve. So, <clears throat> with the high school, um, what you're going to see at this high school is we measured ventilation. Uh, we measured um, ventilation by placing carbon dioxide and monitoring stations kind of around. And you can see that the ventilation in the high school is. Um, is not great. The areas that we have red are areas that we actually measured. Um, this graphic shows four rooms that we measured, and out of the four rooms we measured, all four had high ventilation. And I'm um, sorry, all four had high carbon dioxide, which means all four had bad four times. Um, high school is actually um, 24 years old, 25 years old, and um, the uh, systems, the mechanical systems in it are actually really cool. Um, but if they're not working properly, if their controls aren't controlling dampers and the fans, and um, you should ask Kevin sometimes will tell us how many dampers are in the school. Unbelievable. It's in the hundreds. Um, and many of them are functioning properly. And the reason they're not functioning properly is because the controls in the building can't talk to each other. Um, there are a couple different vintages of controls. Um, those controllers are no longer produced. They're they use a communication protocol that can that no longer is produced. Um, and so the controls uh, are of an age and of a vintage that um, that uh, they, they just can't talk to each other. And so these great systems that you have can't function properly. And that's what's happening in, in the high school um, in a nutshell. So, so what we've gotten here is is really controls, and as we say here, it's the brain of the building. It's what makes these great air handling systems work well. They have some great capacity. They have some great capabilities. They're just not working properly together. So, okay, let's see, I think we kind of that's one of the dampers that, um, like I said, hundreds of these dampers throughout the building. Um, many of them are actually closed. Not many, I shouldn't say that. Um, but some of them are closed, preventing air from moving to certain areas of the building. Oh, yeah. All right, I won't keep that up. Anyway, part of the project is to install new controls and then go through the building um, and, and rebalance and, and recommission. Okay, North Berwick. Um, we've got two, two areas of the building that don't currently have ventilation systems. One is um, a classroom space, and um, the other is the main office and nurses area, um, where there really is not proper ventilation in there. So part of the project is to include ventilation in there. Again, we have exhaust fans and some other terminal equipment as part of it. And then this is the control thing again, the pneumatic controls with the springs and levers. This is a, an example of one of the um, pneumatic controllers. And you actually can kind of see the lever. See the vertical thing right there? That's actually the lever. And the way you adjust it is kind of fascinating. But anyway, uh, 
Anyway, so in the project, we have new controls, new, new controls to replace the new map and to bring it up to date. So, so um, I'm sorry, go back to that. Yeah. So for, for those of us, again, to make sort of a, a pictorial of the technology era, for those of you that do recognize uh, vacuum tubes on the right, that's exactly what you're dealing with when you deal with uh, pneumatic controls. So that's uh, that's the comparative. And I think that does it for my part. I'm going to pass it back on. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions for Steve on the projects and what we're doing and upgrading everything and replacing things that are aged and old and need a replacement? Because now it, it comes the, the fun part, I think, uh, for me and sort of the where we were trying to head. And the part that I, I really want to make sure that folks in this room, I think the, the board understands it, is why we're happy as grant writers and implementers is that when you have projects that total $6.4 million and you say, oh my goodness, that's a lot of money. And it is, but, um, being in Saco and looking at uh, the replacement school there of $110 million uh, and compare that to fixing four schools for $6.4 million. But here's the thing that I hope everybody in this room walks away with, everyone in this room walks away with, and that is from that $6.4 million, the state is giving $3.5 million against that project that this 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 tax paying community does not have to pay back that is part of this school revolving renovation fund program that was our goal at the outset to get as much money from the state to do this extensive work on all this infrastructure that kevin has been maintaining for all these years this way past its useful life that you don't have to pay back. The second piece of that that we've talked about is, is part of that award is a 10 year, 0% financing for $2.6 million. So it's two parts of the award of the SRRF. An outright grant, meaning you don't have to pay back the 3.5 million and then zero percent on 2.6 million dollars and then so there is some contribution which in working with Denise and the administrative team uh, a small piece of the total project that uh, the feeling is is that we'd be able to finance that at bond rates which again is a lower percentage that you would pay on a commercial tax exempt yes so overall, uh, from a, a grant writer's perspective and from a team that has represented and evaluated these facilities, um, I couldn't be happier. I think that the admin team is very happy. I think Kevin hopes that, uh, that the community and the taxpayer understands that protecting your investment, your schools, the health and safety of these schools We've done it in the most fiscally responsible way. So there's a lot of information that comes out of presentations like this. And then if I could just ask the, the everybody in here to, you know, some people glean different pieces at the end of it. And what did you understand? What was your takeaway? What are the key words that you heard? And so I put, five would I think that uh, resonate with me. And that is um, that the infrastructure projects that we're talking about and try to define, they're related to sa safety and well-being of students and staff. Ventilation, air that's properly heated and treated. Um, and most important thing, we're utilizing state funds to help pay for the projects. And third piece, there is no frill in here. 
we're utilizing these funds to only pay for what is necessary. It's almost a like for a like replacement. Yes. Is it modern? And are we taking out pneumatic and putting in modern systems that will reduce maintenance costs, will reduce energy costs? Because those systems that Steve talked about will now be working more congruently. That is true. So, but there isn't anything that we're putting in here above and beyond that uh, would be considered to be um, gold plated or or something that is oh, we're doing this for this teacher or for this administrator. We're replacing light for light. Why? To give you another 25 years, but we're being Yankees, so we're going to get 35 to 40 years. Out of it, right? But to give you that other 25 years and again, emphasizing this is the best program for the taxpayer. Three and a half million dollar grant that you do not have to repay, and 2.6 million that's at zero percent financing. And in the end, no parent, no administrator, no student wants to see school is closed, pipe has exploded, all the things that we've talked about because of age and because of condition, the best condition that it possibly can be that you have a systematic failure that requires a school to be shut down and now you're in emergency mode. And the question is, when can we reopen it? And I don't have that answer for you because today we still have the same situation. We still have product shortages, long lead times. We still struggle for a skilled workforce. So I don't have the answer. What I do have the answer for is there's less likely of a chance for that to happen if you, uh, everyone here and all the citizenry votes uh, in an approval on Christian one, vote yes. And that's the way it looks. And it's, a, you know, it's got many paragraphs and complexities to it, but that's, that's the lawyers, right? They have to cover the complexities. So the admin team did the right thing. They reviewed this. This is the way the ballot has to be worded because it is a bond. It is a debt instrument, but you're also getting back that three and a half million dollars and the two point uh, some odd million at zero percent. So um, we're excited. We've been uh, joyful to be part of this process. Uh, we were especially heartened to get that award. It was a, a big win for the, the team, you know, the grant team, um, Steve, Kevin, the board, all the administrators have been extremely cooperative. And I, I do hope um, that come voting day that uh, the citizens will, will be an affirmative for this because it's very necessary and a very good use of your funds. So. That's it. We'll take any questions, Kevin, Steve, myself. Sir, um, the Noble Middle School, has that already had its um, system, systems updated? Is that why they are not included in your grant funding survey? No. Um, so each one of the remaining schools uh, had a submission. And um, what we're hoping is for an affirmative for this package and then our grant writing team will propose to the administrative team and the board to go back uh, probably polish off and update our submission from last year and do the same ask and that's permissible under the rules and um and and again uh it, it was heartening for us to see all of the schools score very highly in terms of money that could have been awarded, but it would not have been good public relations for the state to award uh, all the money for all your schools. Because like all schools in Maine, um, we tend to run them longer, leaner, um, and they don't get as much love and capital as they, they should, but that would be the plan uh, 
the clock would start ticking uh, immediately after June 11, and we would come back to the board and they'd say, oh, I like Steve, but Don, I'm so tired of listening to you. But that's what we would actually do is we would put forth the other schools um, for your consideration and for the state's consideration. Um, you talked about how the new equipment would last up to 20, 25 years, and I feel like today's equipment never lasts as long as equipment used to last. <laughs> right. So is that is that a realistic timeline to really expect the same life out of what we'd be putting in this piece now? And I'm not I'm not saying that it doesn't need to be replaced. I'm just curious if that's um, a realistic. Yeah, process. I mean, um, the time will tell uh, and and we're we look at the installation, we were just uh, looking at some of the air conditioning equipment that we put into Hatsi and some of it didn't quite come out of manufacturing the way that we wanted. So we had to do a field repair. But um, having said that, it's not as mechanically intensive as this equipment. So therefore it doesn't have as many parts to break. And that would be our hope that the ASHRAE life, and again, it depends upon the component, 15 to 25 years is the span, depending upon the equipment. But yes, we are, and, and again, as long as it's maintained. So Kevin keeps telling me that he's here for another six. Sue says that he's here for another eight. Fiber <laughs> says that he's here for another 10, but it really does count on uh, doing proper maintenance, and then that equipment life could be extended and reach those years. How are you selecting the equipment? You know, so like there must be a variety of brands or options out there. How are you making those decisions? So we work a lot with um, with Steve as a uh, Steve as a licensed professional engineer in the state of Maine. We work with another independent licensed professional engineer in the state of Maine. And then we have yet another, if there's too many engineering brains in the room. And what we do is we compare the success of the manufacturer of the equipment in the school facilities. And we select best equipment that will have the least amount of problems for Kevin. What have we put in or what are we servicing that we're currently seeing issues with other people? You see a lot of... Um, articles and papers about failed ground source heat pump systems that were supposed to save all kinds of money and, and energy, um, but they were improperly designed. The manufacturer is no longer in business. So part of having such a diverse group of engineers talking to project managers and service people is figuring out the best kinds of equipment that will last the longest and is serviceable. That's our process. Any other thoughts or questions? Okay, well, uh, thanks everyone for your time. I think that this is a, a great project and I, I hope it is well received by the community. Thank you, Thank, Thank you. you. We're going to sit here. We're going to go. to 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 we have to get <laughs> I love these little diagrams. You know, oh, first time. Oh, I'm gonna have to get up again. Oh, I have it all. Is it first on the thing? All right, well, we'll start That's the nice. meeting at least and then go. Lovely. Spreading out here. Okay. I'd lovely to still get two. We're gonna have to nice have, like, have a presentation again. So I'm gonna move again. Start the thing and then we'll have to move again. Hi, hi. Are they going to flip the box? Not right now. Because oh, have to, the salmon thing has to come. Oh, my gosh. Okay. 
<laughs> her legs. <laughs> Victoria just stay down there. I feel bad. Now she's gonna. Where all those people come back? Yeah. Yeah. No, there's nobody. Everything running or not yet? I have. I'm gonna have to. <laughs> that out. So I think there's a lot of. Where is Victoria? Like she should stay down there. This is the agenda. Yeah, I already have that. Internet. So I think I know what I have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to go back down. I just felt I was like, I should have told her to stay down below. Um, to you, but yeah, I mean, you can stay right over there. You need one. And, uh, yeah. Every time I come in this room, I'm not online. I have to go in. It's a guest every time. I have no internet too today. I have to. Well, the internet? Too. I go, usually do. Go up to where it says ask. And you go up to the thing that shows your signal. Yeah. She don't have a dual signing yet? Yes. Oh, did you do that? Oh, you weren't here. She was here last time. I thought I was the last one. <laughs> it works. Oh, okay. My guess is that they 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 do these for us to be staff. Fifteen minutes. I'm gonna need yeah. Wi-Fi. Yeah. So that would make sense. Start. I just need. Okay. I'm gonna text them. Yep. I think. Just ask them to come. Thank you again, gentlemen. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Thank you. And begin our meeting. Should we will stand for the pledge of allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thanks for the turn Before we begin our public input statement, um, we do have to make an amendment to the agenda because something was listed twice. So we're going to remove uh, number 11 because we are handling it in number nine. So we we'll make a motion to amend our agenda. So moved. A second. No, also. We had several. All in favor? <laughs> Taking number 11. Right. Yeah. And now our uh, public input statement will be read by our vice chair. <clears throat> The first public input session is a 21 minute session with each person having no longer than three minutes in which to make a statement. But a public second public input session may be held at the end of the meeting if allowed by the board chair. Each speaker will give his her name, address and reason for speaking. Public input is designated for district residents, but the board chair may grant non-residents the opportunity to address the board. Statements concerning subject matter that falls under the law regarding executive sessions, for example, matters involving personnel, cannot be made during public input. We as a community pledge to treat each other as we wish to be treated. We pledge to seek understanding when there may be disagreement. Regardless of outcomes or opinions, we pledge to move forward with respect. This is time for comments and or questions for the board, but please be aware that questions may not be able to be answered at this meeting. Thank you. Is there any public input at this time? Uh, then we'll move to number three, the minutes of May 2nd and May 9th. Let's look at May 2nd first. Well, Lauren. And there's higher. Um, down in retirement, okay. um, there just needs to be space um, for Traverse and the right. third line down. I think that's all I saw. Motion to approve. All in favor. And moving on to May 9th. Paragraph with there were three in the audience. We got there was an executive. I thought it was an executive session. So, do we have an audience? 
So I said the three. Mm-hmm. They said, okay. Yeah, it moves. Okay. Yep. Yeah. That makes sense then. Yeah. Motion to approve. A second. All in favor? Okay. Moving on to celebrations. Okay. We have two um, highlights this evening. The first is going to be Noble Middle School, the STEM Club, and the Sea Perch competition. We have um, audience members here who are going to um, come up. Um, so, Principal Archambault, do you want to start us off or? Are you going to ask to Mr. Pete to do it? Yeah, or Mr. Pete. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Come on down. Everybody, come on down and line up against uh, this wall right here and then stretch out the all the way down there. Yeah, bring those up. So, is it okay if we use the stage up there for a little demo area? Yeah. Would you like us to? Demos. What do you guys think? Do you think we're good? Or thank I you, think... everybody. It's exciting to be here tonight to recognize the achievements of this group of students right here. And I can't predict the future, but we were talking about controls and vacuum tubes and things like that. They get it. I'm these might be some of the kids that solve those problems in about ten to fifteen years. Um, so if you want to go ahead and open up your ROVs on the stage. Okay. Would you like the board to sit below or are you able yeah, to see from up? I, I think you can, can see stand? from there. And I think <laughs> we can, so we're going to stay lined up over here, though. That way we can uh, introduce yeah. ourselves. Yeah. And if one of you, I have a battery. So if you, one of you wants to actually connect it. Tell you want to do that? Cool. And I'll have you come back over here, you guys. So I'll start talking while they're setting up. Uh, so the STEM club is a two-year-old uh, program now at middle school. It was started last year, and the goal is to engage about 20 students more and more in engineering science. Oh, and I bring Chris Herrick up here as well. So Chris is actually our shipyard liaison, and not only an excellent engineer, but he also has a a graduate from Noble High School, and now he's at an eighth grader at Noble uh, Noble High School. Thank you, Chris. Chris has been kind enough to guide us with the shipyard on sponsoring a lot of the things that we do. And this is the most recent. But before we got started with this, uh, this group of individuals will have them introduce themselves here in a second. They went ahead and started with a solar powered little uh, model car. Each one of them built a solar powered model car. And then from there, they went on to backyard rockets, which uh, woke up the uh, woke up the students when we were out of recess one day. <laughs> um, and then last a uh, couple months ago in January, we started working on the Sea Perch project. So the Sea Perch project is actually a national competition. And we participated in it at University of New Hampshire. At University of New Hampshire, there were 18 schools represented, uh, comprising 50 total teams. And the guys with the trophy right here actually won their event. One of our two sixth graders. And Layla is holding the trophy because no middle school out of 18 schools came in second place. Nice. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, it's very exciting. Uh, so now what I'd like to do, if you guys can, um, let's introduce ourselves. So let's start with you, Noah. Noah what? And what, what elementary school did you go to since we were just looking at those ones? Go ahead there, Cook. Uh, my name is Hunter Cook. Uh, I'm from Noble Middle School, and I went to the North Elementary School. Me and my team were the first place players, and the um, challenge horse, unfortunately, two of our teammates are here. Um, we did the baseball game. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on a second. If I can brag about you guys a little bit more, if they had been competing against the high schoolers in that, in that program, they would have come to second place. Wow. Wow. wow, that's awesome. Go ahead there, Zach. Uh, my name is Abby Lane. I am in Noble Middle School, and I am from Norris Berwick Elementary School, and I was in Coach Team. What was the name of your team? Coach Team. 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 <laughs> <laughs> and so 
Brooks Kessler. I'm from the Middle School, uh, from the Northbrook Elementary School, and my team didn't win anything. You did, because you said it really is the school. So you can see the points. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Jackson Runner and I went, I'm from Noble, Noble Middle School and the Huzzy Norton School. Oh, I'm Layla. I'm Layla White. Uh, I'm in the middle school and I'm from Norton School. I am Ella Dinkley. I am in the middle school and I am from Norton Elementary School. And our team is the three pebbles. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Natalie Rondo. I'm from I'm seventh grader in the middle school. I'm from Nolan. <laughs> I'm also part of the three pebbles. <laughs> it's top. Um, I'm Ray on the barrier. I'm in seventh grade at Noble Middle School. Um, I'm from Logan Elementary. And I'm part of the I'm Evan Jones from also from Middle Middle School of York. I know it's one but I'm from Hayden Valley Elementary School in Colorado. Oh wow. And I'm a part of the random guys. Kenny <laughs> <laughs> Kesher on our seventh grade baseball team. Yeah. Um thank you everybody. And yeah. so I'm gonna put somebody on the spot. It's gonna be Ella. Are you ready, Ella? Hold on. All right. So Ella's going to tell you, and I'm going to have Ella. I'm going to have you step right up to that podium. Ella's got a little um, something to share with you on kind of like what we learn, what they learn, and some of the other things to uh, to look forward to in their futures. And while you're doing that, I'm going to have somebody come up and actually plug their ROV into the battery, and you can actually start. You might have to put in a few years. Is it the time that I did this? Though? Yes. <laughs> really, <laughs> yeah, really, really. Come on. I don't know. You, like you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I'll take you away. Good evening. My name is Ella Dupuy. I am in sixth grade at Noble Middle School and a member of Mr. Pete Sea Perch Robotics Program. While building our Sea Perch underwater robot, we learn very valuable lessons, such as teamwork. Working in a group is really challenging. The STEM Sea Perch program taught us how to work together in a group in a productive and successful way. Problem solving and critical thinking. When building our Sea Perch robots, we had to figure out what worked, what didn't work, and how to fix any problems on our own. We also need to figure out how to successfully complete the obstacle courses and all of its challenges. How propellers work. We learned about work thrust, momentum, and other various ways propellers work to make the sea perch robot propel forward vertically and backwards underwater. Responsibility. We've had, we had to be responsible when using various methods to build our sea perch underwater robot, like soldering tiny wires into a small circuit board that is used to control the rover's propellers when it was underwater. The solder was very hot and could sputter into our eyes if we were not careful. Eye protection was required for safety and we needed to be very focused on the task at hand. Communication. Whether it was communicating to each other about how to build our underwater robots or during the actual competition while maneuvering them around the obstacle course, we needed to work on our communication skills to do it. Listening is also a very important part of communication, and we needed to listen to our teacher, Mr. Pete, to learn how to build our sea perch and what the rules were for the competition. I really enjoyed being on Mr. Pete's sea perch team and learned a lot. Only 5% of the world's oceans have been explored. That means 95% of our oceans are still waiting to be explored to discover new things we haven't even dreamed of. Maybe one day, even we might build an underwater robot that will allow us to learn more about our planet. Thank you. Okay. Hey, uh, so the uh, the ROV was actually in the Olympic sized pool there at University of New Hampshire. And if you want to go ahead and have the propellers, each of the each of the um, controls move the propellers in one specific direction. And that allowed it to turn, come up, come down. Uh, actually, go ahead. Go ahead, Lou. Lou your brother. And they built everything. It wasn't like it was put together and they just like 
zip tied it together. They built that entire thing, all the teams, they had five total teams. So, you know, it's, it's uh, I'm, I'm really proud of these guys. And when you're around them for, you know, as much time as I'm around these 20 kids, I think our future is a good end. <laughs> That's awesome. Right. What was the, the best part of the project? What, what did you like the best? Anybody want to chime in on that? I loved building the rubber. That was the fun, fun, fun part for me. Watching it was a lot of fun. Soldering. Soldering. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like watching what we like accomplished and what we made together as like a as like a group. And okay. That's awesome. Would any of one of you um, share one of your biggest challenges in this project and how you uh, work through that? You want to take that? Um, yeah, actually, I think one of our was the drilling. We um, had one of our pipes, or one of our PPC pipes that did a bit so I think we have to do it again. Why did you have to do it again? Um, because somebody messed up. No, I mean, what <laughs> Um, most of the pipes will have to water, uh, water to get into the pipes and so that our ROV could submerge and it would just float on the water because if the pipes didn't have holes in them, it wouldn't be able to go under the propeller, the vertical propeller wouldn't be able to push it down and up. I would say also that one of our challenges was soldering the circuit boards. We had to make sure everything was almost perfect because that is how we controlled our underwater robots. Any of you want to share what your goals are is, and has this had an impact on what, how you see your future? That's a big question. <laughs> no, no. You got anything to answer? Well, I think that this is very exciting for us a lot about team working. Awesome. Awesome. Um, communication was another big thing because making sure that people had their parts done to make sure you can work on to the next part and actually start building it because if you built one part and didn't build another you'd have to go back and sometimes you couldn't go back mm -hmm. wise. anybody else no, no. <laughs> no not really what was something that surprised you as you were going through the whole experience Oh, there was the wax inside the motors. <laughs> <laughs> so to, to the wax that we used was a toilet ring, a toilet bowl wax ring. Yep. And as soon as they saw it, it was for a toilet. <laughs> <laughs> it's done. It's brand new, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, thank you for having oh, oh, a thank, thank you guys. You. Congratulations. What advice would you, as participants, give someone else who is interested in joining this club? Um, you listen to their teammates and mm -hmm. to be able to cooperate with your teammates. And the key goal to be to be able to work with a team of four people is to be able to except that sometimes you might be wrong and think that's right. Wow. Good. That's a big one. Wow. Yeah. Scary anyway. <laughs> we all kind of need that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that's advice for the board. Yeah. <laughs> it's for everybody. Yeah. Oh, good hands. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, definitely. All right. Thank you very awesome. much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Very impressive. Thank yeah, you. very nice. Thank you. This one is going to be a video, so we probably either want to, yeah, or move to the right. The next one, so yeah, we're gonna come on down. Okay. Yeah, I think you should be able to see. That's the key is that make sure you can see after Dave's hearing. That was like being a supermax after corner. Didn't do anything like that in school. No, that was cool. Yeah, that's very cool. Look at those students have got life lessons out of it. Sure.
I was with them forever. All right, so this next uh, video is from Knowlton School. We do have um, some of our representatives from Knowlton School here. Um, this video is about the sailing the program that they've been working through, the grant that they received. Um, we weren't sure how late this evening was going to be, so some of our children are did a pre-recording of um, this wonderful project that they've been working on. So here it is. Hi, I'm Michelle. I am a fifth grade teacher at Eric L. Milton School, and we are super excited to introduce the Fish Friends program. Um, the Fish Friends program is an initiative to get endangered Atlantic salmon into schools to help teach students about science and conservation and the importance of the keystone species um, and reintroducing them into the rivers of Maine. Um, this program gave us 200 wild made Atlantic eggs. Um, so they started out in eggs and we have been raising them uh, since March. Those kids have gotten to see them and make observations of them as eggs when they got here. And now, as you can see, we have fish. Um, they're in the fry stage and they're coming to pick them up today. The students at Eric Global in school had the opportunity to come look at the tank and make observations, and they charted their observations in our data tracking sheet um, and did water testing to make sure that the fish had clean water um, and did water changes. Um, they made observations about the movement of the fish, um, the habitat that they're in, the habitat that they will be in, and they did some art connections with the fish as well, along with charting their life cycle and doing research about their ecosystem. Um, students even got the opportunity to travel to UNE to go to their main marine biology lab and see large full grown Atlantic salmon um, that were in captivity and got an opportunity to go to the salmon hatchery and Saco and learn about what it takes to make this program happen. Peace. This was a really cool opportunity for the Eric O. Moulton School, and it was made possible by grants. So this did not cost the Eric L. Moulton School any money out of pocket. Um, and we are super lucky that these grants um, should be available to us next year. So we will be able to do this program again and give the fourth graders the opportunity uh, to immerse themselves in the life of salmon and learn all about what it takes to help an endangered species um, come back and the importance of having them in our communities. Uh, while the main Atlantic salmon are really unique, they have really long lives for fish. They can live eight to 13 years. Um, and it takes about three years from salmon um, that are fried to go out into the Atlantic Ocean and then come back and lay eggs again. So this is a really um, important project, but it's gonna take a lot of time and energy, and we're super excited to be able to help um, and teach the kids about the importance of this species and reintroducing them into the man's rivers. I'm Dylan, I'm Hudson, I'm Eliza, I'm Brooke, and I'm Ava, and I'm doing it for uh, wait, you know, yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ava, and I'm doing it for Ava, and we're doing the same presentation. <laughs> 
Introduction. Male ethics salmon are endangered, so we need to help protect them. So get ready to dive in and learn facts about Maine Atlantic salmon. In this slide, you will learn about Maine Atlantic salmon life cycle, their habitat, the role they play in the ecosystem, human connections, and threats and conservation. Life cycle of the same. Would you like to learn about the same words? Here's an example on how the life cycle works. First, the mom lays eggs, and then the eggs become odd eggs. After that, they hatch and become elven. Elven have an eggs to attach for food and nutrients. Once the water hits a certain temperature, they turn into fried, then car, then small, then adult, and last, spotted a duck. Fun fact, if the water temperature is too cold or colder, they can completely affect the life cycle. Salmon in the ecosystem. Atlantic salmon play a huge role in the river ecosystem. The salmon eggs at the bottom of the river release vital nutrients and minerals for other animals in that river. The albendismal stages are a huge role for predators like tuna, bass, and bears. When they get to the adult stage, they are prey for predators like swordfish and sharks. Just because the salmon are in the food chain means that they that it makes a difference to the ecosystem. Salmon habitats. The main Atlantic oh. salmon lives in streams and rivers in central and eastern Maine. They lay their eggs in gravelly areas. Atlantic salmon need access to a wide variety of habitats during their lives as they move from rivers to the oceans and back again. Humans and connections. People have interacted with the salmon in ways that make them endangered. Some ways are overfishing because people have caught too many Atlantic salmon, but the salmon population can't stay healthy because they aren't, there aren't enough adult salmon to produce more eggs. Atlantic salmon are important because they keep the rivers ecosystems healthy by being part of the food chain. Oh, sure. Threats and conservation. There's some reasons why salmon are endangered. So let's go over them. Major threats are covert salmon and now It blocks their way to open the it blocks their way to spawn. There is a poor water quality in some places like trashing in rivers or oceans. There's some ways people are protecting salmon. So some people are trying to connect the, the ocean freshwater habitats and increasing the population. Students can help too. They can ask their school if they can raise salmon like my school and they can give it back when they are either for far or from Conclusion. That's why we should protect the main Atlantic salmon. And if we don't, we think it go extinct. So I hope you will learn something and try to help the environment stay big. Thank you, Robert. Thank you for your help and response. Cheers. Mrs. Tessels, Chris, Ms. Billy's, Ms. Mr. Dermis, and Ms. Mills, and Ms. Mills, and Ms. Mills, and Ms. Hey, any questions? Because we do have um, Nolten here. So if there are any questions. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. Okay. So you raise these salmon from little eggs. How did you feel when you had to say goodbye? <laughs> That's a really great question. So we got the salmon as I eggs, and we got a, the really cool opportunity of going to the salmon hatchery in Saco um, and seeing the process that got us the eggs. Um, but it was really awesome to see the kids not only watch them grow up and like name them um, and chart them and track their data and watch them really develop, um, but also to see where they're going to go um, and what um, this program does is really trying to get them back into our natural habitat and how important that is. Um, so for our students, it was really amazing to see how concerned they are about the salmon populations and about their native ecosystems and really wanting 
to put them back into the rivers um, for future generations to be able to enjoy and really understanding the idea that this isn't an immediate fix, right? Um, these uh, 190 salmon that they put back, the goal is that they're gonna come back in three years and lay even more eggs um, and really trusting that process um, and feel like that commitment. Um, and so I've had students be like, I can't wait in three years, I'm gonna go to the river, I'm gonna see them. And understanding that like this is a long-term investment in their futures um, and seeing that this is just one small part of it was really great. In addition to the natural resource aspect and the environmental aspect, I think you also learned a little bit about parenting. <laughs> uh, how long did you have um, from the eggs until they when they left? So back? we got them in March, and we just got rid of our last salmon today. Oh. Okay, and is this is this opportunity open to um, like all? Like, I mean, uh, how did you find out this opportunity? Is it is it are they looking for more and more elementary schools to to do this? Is it? So I was on a wait list for three years. Oh, wow. um, and part of the wait list was like getting the funding, um, getting the grants, because all of this was funded through grants um, that were environmental grants and like specifically like community partners that felt really invested into this project. Um, so part of that was getting funding, but then also um, these are rare. Um, they're an endangered species in the state of Maine. So the eggs are heavily protected. Um, so not everyone can get them. Um, so the salmon hatchery that we went to was talking about how difficult it is for just them to get eggs um, and how even at the salmon hatchery, they are having trouble getting eggs and they have to contact people that are outside of the state of Maine um, because there are so few Atlantic salmon left. Um, so this was really, really special that our school got this opportunity um, because it was really hard to get the eggs even for our salmon hatchery. Um, and they were generous enough and trusting enough to be able to hand those off um, to a bunch of fifth graders to really protect and cherish them. Um, and and them grow. to not only get eggs, but to find the cooler because it's really important to keep that hang cool. Where did we end up getting it? Because we thought there was going to be a big long road trip involved in this because yeah. you can't just get a, what, a cooler. You know, it's not like raising a fish in your in your living room. Um, yeah, so we have an industrial cooler um, at our school now that's to keep the salmon uh, tank temperature at, um, well, it, we raise the temperature throughout the year, but keeping it really cold, it started at like 33 degrees um, and trying to keep it as close to the natural river temperature as possible. So we, we had to search long and hard for that cooler and then um, the grant that funded buying the cooler and all of the other materials um, for the aquarium to make sure that the fish were safe and healthy. Um, and then watching the kids really take pride in how the tank looked and felt and making sure that um, the salmon had artwork that explained why they were there um, and making sure that the salmon felt like they were a sense of our community as well. Um, so they checked on them almost every day and our school even put together a website um, so that if they didn't get a chance to look at the salmon, they could log on and see the salmon's progression and growth and really track that visually. So they got to watch the salmon go from just eggs to being able to see the eye in the egg and then go from the egg to the alvin where they could see the egg sacs still attached and then watch those egg sacs slowly disappear as the fish are getting the nutrients. Um, and see them really grow and develop. And our school was super lucky because, um, and I didn't know this, but when they came to pick up the salmon, we had a two-headed salmon, which they have never seen in this program before. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had a two-headed salmon at Eric O'Neill in school and the, the students got to watch and search for it. And it was like, oh, where's the two-headed salmon? And we talked a little bit about like the developmental abnormalities um, that fish can have and um, talking about how that might affect their rate of survival and talking about how those adaptations can lead over time um, to whole species changing um, and what that leads um, to and what that means for their environment and how that might have happened. Um, and it was really 
an amazing experience that our students got to be really hands on and up close and personal with um, these creatures that are in our natural ecosystem. How is your hatch rate compared to what normally would be expected? Um, the hatchery was a really interesting experience. Um, the hatchery talked about how they had to. Oh, the hatch rate? Hatch rate. I'm yes. so sorry. Our hatch rate was really amazing. I was very worried about it because this was my first time raising salmon. Um, and when they talked about it, they were like 24 fry made it, uh, 30 fry made it, and we had 190. Yeah. Um, and so you think out of 200 eggs, that's amazing. That's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. Well, yeah. you also have the concern about when they lost power. Yeah. 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 And he brought it, which was yeah. you know, freaky. But um, you guys were very worried about your. Yeah. <laughs> they were well insulated. Yeah, we talked about it a lot. It's like, it's great. There's no problem. That's, okay. yeah. that's great. Well done. Yeah. Well done. Well done. Do you have to stay down here or no, you guys can go back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Our audience is doing <laughs> See, okay. I did. Thank you so much. Thank you. Again, very impressive stuff. Okay. All right. Okay, so I'm Sharon Beckwith. I serve um, Stat 60 as a steam integration specialist. I work primarily with kindergarten through fifth grade. Um, and Don Pete was an awesome intro for why we have this program in the district. Um, before I get started on why I'm really here, I'm here to explain um, about a Teach with Tech grant, which allowed us to purchase some awesome equipment that is in our schools. But I wanted to highlight some of the things that have happened over the two years since STEAM has become part of the district. We have created a relationship with a shipyard and Chris Herrick, who you met earlier, is such an awesome individual and parent. He and I have worked together with other representatives from the shipyard and their outreach program. Our students have access to an incredible library of equipment at no charge that is transported by one of the engineers here to the high school and then I distribute it to our students. Um, they have done wonderful things with circuits and just it's phenomenal. Um, they also have created an opportunity where our students spend a full week each month in all of the K through three schools with engineers in their STEAM classrooms. Mm -hmm. These engineers come in and assist with curriculum that we've developed or bring materials and teach kids what they're learning today, the impact it can have on their careers. Many of them are actual district parents who are working with our kids, and that has happened throughout the year. And I swear that the engineers have way more fun than the kids. <laughs> they love coming. Um, next week is their last week this year. And I've already gotten emails about how sad they are that it's going to happen. <laughs> this relationship also led to Chris and Amanda Pooler um, writing a Department of Defense grant that allowed for the purchase of $11,000 worth of Legos. Our kids in our schools have had access to um, their Lego League materials. Um, it's phenomenal. Um, in front of you, you see a stage. Our kids have gone through a program and their program is very scripted. They're provided with notebooks. They're provided with um, engineers who, who give them those leading questions. And a lot of the work behind this is about 
what it takes to be part of an engineering design team, that everyone has a job, that just like these students, you have to rely on each other, you have to back up, you have to take when your idea is not the best idea and work on that. So um, we have had a full Lego League um, four K through three in all of our elementary schools. Um, our technology staff has also worked with the shipyard over the two years. We've had six family events. We've had everything from a pumpkin chunking challenge <laughs> where family, it was a family event. Families worked together to create either a catapult or a trebuchet and came to the high school on a Saturday and launched them. <laughs> um, we've had other family steam nights where we set up activities and stations that highlight some of the things that kids are doing in schools. Um, most recently, we had an event at um, the Huzzy School. We had 400 people show up and participate. And the shipyard volunteers brought straw rockets and giant Legos. And it just, it was awesome to see families engaged in things that have nothing to do with our technology or our screens. <laughs> but they used all of the things that these kids are learning. But the primary reason that I'm here is I wrote a grant um, in, well, probably my first summer on board. Um, it was through Milty. It was a Teach with Tech grant. And what that grant provided was the purchase of laser printers. Our um, elementary students have access to being able to work on an engineering design challenge. And instead of just making it out of copy paper or cardboard, they actually get to bring their creations to life. Um, these printers can engrave, print, cut, out of paper, cardboard, wood, acrylic. We received um, a donation from Rome out of Sanford. They provided 600 sheets of acrylic for the students. In front of you, you have some of the products that students made. Um, in one school, um, third graders who work with Maine, um, Wildlife habitats created dioramas. They had to do research using their computers to actually create a, a working model of a habitat. They then designed their own animals. The animals that are in these dioramas, they researched. They had to learn how to build them to scale. They then took their drawings. They were inserted in the cameras, read them, and cut them out. So they got to watch the lasers actually do this. These are some of the examples in front of you. Um, there's a couple of puzzles in front of you that are wooden puzzles. Those were created by kindergarten and first graders. They did designs with their art teachers and then brought those designs to their STEAM class. They were then engraved. They could select on the screen that they wanted to create a puzzle, choose how many pieces in their puzzle. They were engraved, cut out. They now took those puzzles back to their classrooms, shared them with their friends, built them, and then took them home. They're learning that even at their young age, an idea can come to reality and um, be shared. The other thing um, in front of you that I love are um, there are some lights. At the Knowlton School, they work very hard on social emotional learning. We are seeing the effects of COVID in ways that we never dreamed. These were created so that students could highlight their own likes they could shine their own lights. So what they did was they were, they did research to find out what is a laser? How are they used in our world? 
how can I create something with a laser? They then went into the design programs. They designed the acrylic that you see in front of you to represent how they feel about themselves. What are their likes? What are their interests? And how could they take their 2D design and turn it into something 3D? They actually used our 3D printers that use um, filament and printed the bases and then incorporated the two mm. together. So they're using all of their technology. Um, so we wrote that grant. Our original hope was that those two, two printers could be moved within the elementary schools. We learned very soon that they're extremely delicate, the cameras and the lasers, moving them and moving them from North Berwick to Lebanon puts them at risk. So plus it took a while to onboard. None of us had ever used laser printers before. So the technology staff learned first, passed that on to the two that have the, the machines in their buildings now they learned the programs, they learned the designs, passed it on to the students. We have also applied this year for three more of those printers. We want one in each of the elementary schools and we want Don Pete to have one. <laughs> if, that, if that grant is successful, we will have put those tools from kindergarten to 12th grade in our district. So we will have people who will fix those machines because they started at SAD 60, learning how to be an engineer, whether they're five or eight or 15. So I'm very excited to have had the opportunity to write those grants and to see students like this who are just a few years older. They started as fifth and sixth graders without STEAM. Can you imagine what our kids who are starting now will be able to accomplish? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know that all third graders have the opportunity, but a lot of the third graders took their projects to kindergarten and taught a whole lesson to the kindergarten classrooms with their projects and like all research and everything. That's awesome. Yeah. That's amazing. And interject from the audience, none of this would be possible without Sherry. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, she like, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Financial summary. Hey, I don't know. I think the most boring thing in the night so far. <laughs> Denise, isn't it fun to see? You, like we sit on the side of of reading the grants and yes. signing off on the grants, but wasn't that fun? Yeah. Sharon, Sharon yeah, a product. Yes. My frequent yes. Frequent participants yes. <laughs> writing, writing lots of grants, yep. and in fact, a lot of the faculty were yes. signing off on more and more teachers. Awesome. Oh, great. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, not the, you know, the big federal ones we usually talk about, but all of these that are so important and lead to these great moments. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. That's why we're watching the pennies in the financial. <laughs> <Right. laughs> um, so you received, so during the budget process, we got a little behind with speaking uh -huh. to the monthly uh, financial summaries. Things are going along. You can see that we are uh, Revenue-wise, right on track, expecting, um, still expecting about 16% at the end of uh, April, and we have about 17% of the fiscal year left. So, again, that's right there. Um, and we still have approximately 6% of our budget remaining uh, for the prior the last two months of the Are year. Are you looking at April or February? April. April. Oh, I was Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Again, I'm willing to answer questions about any of the months, um, but that as of April, that's kind of where we are. That's most up to date. Yes. Maybe just speak to the fact that we have 6% left, but we have, we, we encumber money to cover all of yes. the so, yeah. so the encumbered, I mean, so the amount remaining, that 6%, does not include the salaries and wages that we have encumbered and set aside to pay out during the year. So those funds are still available. These are um, 
things that have not yet come to pass or that maybe won't. Um, the one I thought of recently was um, while we have a plowing contract um, for snow, we also have snow removal. Didn't need to use any of those funds this year. So we, there are now pockets that we are starting to see where some of, you know, some things where we saved and some things where we went over. So we're at that time of year where we're starting to, to uh, get a clearer picture of um, where we're, where we're headed. But um, so Denise, if, if like, if this were the end, I'm just saying, if yes. this was the end, that essentially that 6% would be in designate or undesignated reserve. Yes. So it goes into the fund balance. Anything we have, that we underspent will get uh, rolled into that. Um, and then it goes to that calculation. You have a copy in your budget binder, but basically we take the audited fund balance at the end of a year, and then we you know, subtract out anything we applied to a future budget, and that's where we get our fund balance. And it just kind of duplicates that process every year. It is, uh, uh, where's, where's six percent maybe this is a question more for june where's six percent historically i mean is that is that significantly um, different or somewhere in the same it will be higher we will definitely go down from there because there are bills that are not accrued electricity bills mm -hmm. that are still outstanding we have a lot of things that we clean up at the end of the year we make sure all of our staff have submitted for their reimbursements if they had travel if um, there are unexpected expenses needed at the end of the year uh graduation expenses things like that so this number will definitely yeah. go down um it's hard to it's hard to say post covid pre covid i probably could have given you a good ballpark of where we might end up um and it's usually we used to say somewhere in the 3% range sure. um but uh, post covid it's been a little more uh difficult to um predict so closely okay. i guess is how i would say thank that. you Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. Moving on to number seven, Title 20A, Section 14854, Authorization to Transfer Funds. Okay. And we have this every year. This is something that we um, get permission from the board and approval from the board so that we are able to um, transfer funds no more than 5% during the summer months, primarily. Mm -hmm. Um, what else, uh, just if I could speak briefly on it. So the, the law allows us to transfer up to 5% from one particular budget category to another to cover an overage. And what I would point to, for example, is our career technical education, which we've been looking at. There's a negative $1,276 balance. Um, what the 5% allows me to do is say, oh, well, regular instruction has money that they didn't spend. I'm going to move some of that budget, $1,276 from that budget, down to career and technical to make them come out to zero um, for the year. And that's that's primarily what this 5% allows us to do. We are not allowed to go over our budget. So our budget, $45,237,000. I can't spend a penny more than that. But sometimes the needs need to shift between categories. So the, approving this 5% transfer allows me to take care of that. Is that just by category? Or, I mean, there's lots of line items in the budget. It's by category. So do you just need a motion? Motion to approve. So I think there's... I have to read it, yeah. yeah. I make a motion pursuant to Section 14854 of Title 20A. The superintendent of schools be authorized to transfer not more than 5% of the total appropriation for any cost center in the current fiscal year operating budget to another cost center or among other cost centers, provided that the total current fiscal year operating budget shall not be increased by such transfers. Second. <laughs> All in favor. Wait, 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 discussion? Yeah, discussion. Will we be notified of any changes? Will we get a, a list of what those changes are? So usually those changes happen during the audit process. So you can see when they present one of the pages in the audit will show you the original budget and then it will show you the adjusted budget compared to actual. So that's generally how we come back and you can see it. It's an auditing because you're doing it throughout the summer. It's not like... Okay. something you do in june so. right no we wait until because we still have throughout the whole summer we're still accruing expenses we're still getting final invoices right, um, we don't complete our, the financial side of our audit till at least with the auditors in the building october but 
December. Um, so will you just highlight that page for us when it, when, yes. when it comes to that I'm aware of it? Well, luckily on June 1st is our first June meeting. Yes. Our auditor will be in to discuss the 23 audit. So on I'll the make sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I'll make sure I'm going to have both for you before you leave. Okay. <laughs> uh, you can read and I'll, I'll, ta I'll tag it. Thank you, Denise. Appreciate that. I'm ready. All good. Okay. So now I'll be okay. ready to vote. All in favor? Thank you very much. Thank you. And item eight, donation, Charles S. Hatch, Post 79, American Legion, Berwick, $500 to the backpack pro program. So another that's a motion. Motion to accept, and thank you very much. Second. Yeah. Second. Oh, I can do it. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Okay. <laughs> Okay. And number nine, uh, reduction in force discussion. Okay, we began this discussion uh, at our last meeting when we nominated uh, probationary staff, some um, probationary staff from one to two or two on to continuing contract. Um, basically, we um, listed those um, features that were potentially going to be rift. Um, because we wanted to show that they were in good standing so that if they come back into our district at any point in time over the course of their, their contracted time when they're um, able to do so, uh, that we have them in good standing. So we have two portions what we need to do this evening. So the first part, and you're going to be getting this information. So the first part is that we need a motion to eliminate the positions. And then there needs to be a motion to terminate the contracts for those specific features. So similar to how we did the probationary list, we don't read the names, but you will have them. You have those names. So I'm gonna hand these out and then we can have any conversation, discussion, questions. Yes. There are two separate votes, votes and they're both on this one sheet. Thank you. Question and discussion. I'll I'll make the motion um, to eliminate the positions listed. I just, do I do I do I number the positions? You can let you can read the positions. Okay, to eliminate the positions as listed below, three noble flex positions. One team of four from Noble Middle School, one behavior interventionist, uh, which was ESSER funds from the Noble Middle School, one PE due to consolidation, one art position due to consolidation, and one world language teacher from the Noble High School. Second. I'll second. Can I ask a question before mm -hmm. we vote? Okay. Yes, yeah, discussion. This is the total of all people in the district that are not. They're not coming. They're not coming back. Because I heard the number fifteen. Through this is the number of that. positions that have been reduced in this budget. Here's the thing that just needs to be clear: many of these positions, or several of these people, will actually be able to go into current open positions. Right. Mm -hmm. So the numbers are different mm -hmm. in terms of bodies versus positions. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I just don't know where so, the number 15 came from. That's yeah, so to your point, that's 11, but some right. of those are actually going to be moved into other positions. Well, I understand that. No, 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 I'm just saying you're right. So, so this sounds like, right. so yeah. the other yeah. mm -hmm. pieces, this is the teaching position. There are other positions that have been reduced, okay. but they are not in the teaching contract position. Okay. okay. So, the, so then the physical positions itself are a little bit more than that, because there was two clerical and uh, three other type positions. Okay, so, so we don't have to vote on that. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. No. You do not have to. This tonight is really about the right. contracted. Two clerical and three. And three educational. Yeah. Thank you. And the motion. I seconded. Victorious. And any more discussion? All in favor? Opposed. Okay. And now we need a motion uh, to terminate the contract. And I'll, I'll make that same motion and I move to um, terminate the contract for the following teachers and they are as, as as listed. Yeah. 
There are five. Anyone second? I'll second. Any questions or discussion? All in favor? Regret. Yeah, with regrets. Mm -hmm. Moving on to employment. Okay, thank you. So what I'm going to do is when we have resignation and retirement letters, if we get information about like if they're moving to a different position or if they're relocating, I'll say that, but some of them don't necessarily provide that information. So I'll tell you what I what we have. So the first one, and we need to make a motion on every single one of these individually, so it's not as a group. So the first one is Sarah LaRanger. She's currently at Noble High School as the health teacher. She is resigning and she accepted a position at Yarmouth High School for the, a similar position. Motion. I'll motion. make that motion. Second. Kate. Kate. All in favor? The next one is Maria Cannon. She's at, um, currently Noble High School instructional coach. Um, her husband has been relocated to San Diego and she has resigned due to that relocation. Except, second. I'll second. I'll okay. And then we have Karen Heim, Noble Middle School social worker. Motion. Motion to vote. I'll move. Uh, actually, you just keep that. That's great. <laughs> 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 okay. So it was Miss. Okay. okay. All in favor. Okay. And then Jamie Hallmeyer Stewart, um, Lebanon Elementary School, grade four. She has accepted an assistant principal position in Farmington, New Hampshire. Oh, wow. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah. yeah. Congratulations. Right. Nice. It's exciting for her. Congratulations. Yes. Yes. Motion. Who's doing? I make the motion <laughs> with regrets. And second. Kate. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Heather LaViolet. She's currently Lebanon Schools Excel teacher, and she just listed for family for family reasons. Motion to accept. Second. I'll second it. I'll second it. <laughs> Are you voting? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm paying attention. Okay, and then we have Natalie Batchelder. She's um, Hussey School, grade one. She has accepted a preschool position in Kittery. Oh, motion to accept. Second. No, second. All in favor? <laughs> no, it works really well. Yes. Josh is right. It's easy for me to be like, okay, same people. <laughs> I'm kidding. It's okay. okay. And then the next one is just an FYI. There is no motion that needs to be made for this one. Um, Kristen Johnson, who is the administrative assistant at North Berwick Elementary School. She's been there for about four years. Um, she took another administrative assistant role in an office. Oh, and we don't need to push these. Right, okay. right. So we're going to move on to retirements. And um, two of these are just an FYI um, to recognize the, the time in. And the last one is a teacher. So we will need a motion on that. Okay. So Lisa Rose is um, currently a custodian at Hussey School. She's been with our district for 20 years. So she is going to be finishing up um, at the end of June. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so much for that service. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then Marty Roberts, who's at Noble Middle School as an ed tech. Um, she's been there six years, so she will be retiring in June as well. Oh, thank you. And the next one, I am very happy that you are in the audience. Yeah. Good evening. So, yeah. <laughs> so, Deborah Butler, um, Noble Middle School Special Education, 43 years. Oh, wow. <laughs> In another school. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Deb. Thank you. Thank you. So we need a motion. Motion to accept with regret. And great thanks. Yeah. And great thanks. And wahoo for you. Yeah. <laughs> Second. And who's all in favor? But for that. Who's the first? Peg. Peg. Was a peg. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay. And superintendent update. Okay, so just a quick update on next week. Um, we will be in the auditorium 
for 6 30 p.m we are um working on child care um in the B gym, which is the smaller of the two gyms. Um, when we confirm that that happens, we will send communication out about that. We feel that that will help um, just help with families come, being able to come in. We've heard that, that it's it's a struggle sometimes to come in for the meeting at that time. So you will be on um, the stage like we we have been for some of the budget meetings and it will be split into three sections per town um, for those of you who haven't been there. So the vote when you come in, even as a board, you come in and you you register at your you check in at your town spot and then you come up to sit. Um, we will you will get a, a piece of paper to make some of those, um, mm -hmm. you know, votes. votes and then there will be a couple that will be written we will have to we'll elect a moderator and we'll go through each article and we're just we're going to take our time going through the articles and um as residents feel free to speak um because you you know you are a resident as well as on our board but just don't feel like you can't speak at that time we just want to make sure you Can i ask yes. a question about the process because sure. i'm never yes. clear of this so um residents can get up and speak to whatever and can they move for money to be added to a certain budget line or decreased or yes. how does yes yes Just either either way yes. either way and then that small body votes and if it's majority approves that's the amount yes. that goes into the budget yes. right mm -hmm. okay yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. second yes oh, wait denise has a just one clarification is that it's not residents, it's registered voters. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, thank you. yes. Yeah. Yeah. yes. Yeah. And we are going to send a reminder. Denise held up her budget, her annual report. We are asking that those come in because we don't have extra, a bunch of extra copies here. So, so we if will, people bring it with them, that would yeah, be helpful. That would have be helpful. people gotten them in the mail? Yeah. Yes. Do we know? Um, yes. Victoria hasn't yet. No, I haven't. Part of Lebanon hasn't, right? But you guys have. Oh, well, you gave us one, so I didn't write yeah. it. Yeah. Well, I got mine. Some that got it in Lebanon and some that haven't gotten it yet. So we're assuming it'll be there in the next uh, little while. Yeah. Yeah, I got mine last week. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, some of the okay. select board don't have them yet. So, okay. All right. Um, and then it just takes as long as it takes to we'll go through the process. So, can I ask you a quick question? Yes. So, for graduation, yes. What is it that we're we're supposed to wear our cap and gowns? Um, but so, what does that mean exactly? So, do you wear honor cords? Do you wear the tassel? Do you so? We typically just let folks know that we are going to participate and then we just tell them what our colors are, what schools we went to. And so we don't go into the, we don't typically wear, like if you're a doctorate, you don't wear a little, but you can if you want to. It's really just about um, presenting. It's the robe. With the robe to, you know, at that night, that's all. It's not, it's not, it's just a, it's kind of. Are you just wearing the robe and that's it? Yeah. So we are not wearing yeah. sashes or. We do typically wear, um, the sash from our schools yeah if you have it if you do you do i don't know I mean, on our sash but that was yeah but i don't i don't have anything that says right <laughs> i think does jen get them jen yeah, she, yeah. yeah. Like let's just ask like what let's talk then. yeah like, okay because i have everything okay so it, there was no reason to go out yeah. and just it. you yeah. know what i mean yep right so. okay well let's let's talk afterwards jerry i know I, i've got I think that's it. That's it. We just want to make sure we covered that process for okay. the budget hearing next week. All right. Uh, and our last public input. Do you have any public input? Uh, John Hall, Northbrook. Um, I am curious of the. Um, Positions of people that are retiring. Uh, how many of those are not being filled or aren't currently? Um, I would say, um, looking at the retirement list, that the position at no Noble Middle School um, is not being filled in that capacity. 
Which one? one? The, that's the smarty smarty yet. Yeah. yeah, that's the yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's one of the three that we've been talking about. Okay. Yeah. Right. Just clarification, are you talking about the ed techs or special, special education? The ed tech. Mm -hmm. I can stop. Uh, other public input? Uh, I make a motion. Oh, to do it your own. Second. <laughs> All in favor? Okay. It All right. I think yeah, Denise has yeah. gifts. Yeah. Mm -hmm.